Hi there, this is David Hillier and I'm going to give you a video on cost of capital and in particular how you would reduce the cost of capital if you are a manager in your own company. Now let's think about cost of capital. Cost of capital is can, can be considered in two different ways. First way, let's think about it from the perspective of the manager. If I wish to invest in a project, I need to raise capital to invest in that project. Now, I have to give money back to any investor who wishes to give me money. I have to give them some type of return back to compensate them for the capital that they've provided to me, to my company. So that means that the return that I give to investors the compensation I give to investors is a cost to my company. Now, from the investor's perspective, the compensation that they receive for investing in my company is a return. It's a reward. So the cost to you as a manager is a return to investors who are giving the money to you. So there has to be some type of, of trade-off. If you give too much away to investors for the risk that your company has, then you're not going to find profitable projects or value-adding projects that will compensate the company for the, the return that they're having to give investors. Now, similarly, if you give too little to investors, so that means your cost is too low, then no investor will wish to put money into your company. So the return to investors must be appropriate for the level of risk that your company has. And that's the risk that your investors will bear when they invest in you. But managers are always looking for ways in which to reduce their cost of capital. Why? Well, if you can reduce the cost of capital and the market is efficient, then it's equivalent to a reduction in the risk. Because remember, there's a relationship between risk and expected return. So the higher the return that an investor gets in an efficient market, then the higher the risk that they think they're getting. Consequently, the lower the return, they're getting in an efficient market, the lower the risk of the investment. So as a manager, you can try and reduce the risk of your company. And we call that the weighted average cost of capital. But there are other ways in which you could try and lower the cost of capital in practice. And that is through a number of different decisions. And I'll talk about these just now. So the theory on this isn't like the standard corporate finance theory. It's different from that, but it's really practical considerations to think about when you're wanting to reduce the cost of capital. Now that could either be the cost of debt or the cost of equity, but we're going to focus on the cost of equity. Now let's talk about transaction costs and bid -ask spreads. When investors decide to buy or sell the securities of a company, they have to come to a price. But the counterparty um, will also have a price that they're thinking of. And if you're, if you're thinking of buying and selling any good, then a, a, a principle is that you, you buy low and you sell high. And you can use an example like a car. If you want to go into a car dealership, and sell that car, you would sell the car for, say, 11000 And you walk out the door, you then decide you've changed your mind, and you go straight back in and you say, I want to buy the car. And they say, well, okay, you sold it to us at 11000 we'll sell it to you for 12000 because the dealer has to make some profit. And in a dealer market, that's uh, what you get. And I covered this. Way back in um, chapter one of my book uh, about the different types of markets. In a dealer market, you buy low and you sell high. But from the manager's perspective, you have to think about the cost of capital. And 
your cost of capital is the return that investors get. So then you have to think about, well, okay, how do investors get a return? Do they buy and do they sell? Uh, they buy my securities and then they sell my securities. So that difference between buying and selling is important, especially if the equity of the company is publicly traded on a stock exchange. So let's look at the first example, Security A. In Security A, we have a bid-ask spread of 2. Why is it 2? Well, you've got the bid price at 99 and you've got the offer price or the ask price at 101. So that bid and ask price, that's from the dealer's perspective, the counterparty's perspective. So I want to buy Security A, I have to pay 101. If I want to sell Security A, I have to sell at 99. So for me to make a profit, the price of security has to go up by two at the very minimum. So before I even do anything, any even for me to make any profit, it must go up by two. Now you look at security B, and security B has a larger spread. The spread here is 10. So I buy at 105 and I sell at 95. So this security must go up by 10 before I can make any profit. So that security is less liquid than the first security, security A, which has only a spread of two. So liquidity, and that has an impact on the return that I get, is directly related to transaction cost. If the transaction costs are greater, you'll have lower liquidity. And let's look at um, security C. Security C, you buy at 106 and you sell at 98. So the buying price is higher than security B, uh, but in the selling price, uh, selling price is higher than security B as well. So let's look at the difference in the prices. The difference in the prices uh, is 8. 106 minus 98 is 8. So the spread in security C is lower than the spread in security B. So therefore C is more liquid than security B. So the higher the transaction costs, the lower the liquidity. And the lower the liquidity, the more it costs for the manager. Why? Because an investor must get higher return from their investment when it's less liquid. The higher return that the investor requires re results in a higher cost. So Lower liquidity, higher cost of capital. Higher liquidity, lower cost of capital. And that's quite an important relationship. So you as a manager should be trying to ensure that your equity is more liquid. Now let's look at a situation where we have what is known as adverse selection. And adverse selection is when some investors know more about the equity than other investors. We, we can talk about insider trading when managers of a company are buying and selling the shares of the company. So clearly they'll have more information than outside investors. And you see a result when that happens from the markets. If there's more uncertainty, if there's more adverse selection, if, if outside investors, normal investors like you and I, know less than inside investors, and we know that the inside investors are taking advantage of us, then we will probably sell only sell for higher than we would expect and only buy lower than we would expect. So you see the spreads increasing when there is adverse selection. So having insiders trading um, the shares of the, their own company, having your managers trading the shares of your own company, and if they're taking profits from this continuously, you'll get... Larger spreads, which lead to lower liquidity, which leads to a higher cost of capital. So adverse selection is a big problem. And managers have to try and um, deal with that. But also regulators need to deal with that as well. And one way in which we can reduce the cost of capital is by listing on stock exchanges that have lower costs. Uh, because the lower costs in an exchange 
is linked to the return that investors get. So the less costs an investor gets then uh, or incurs, then the higher the return that you get. And we can see here that you can look at different types of costs that a company may face when deciding on listing on particular stock exchanges. So I might be a Chinese company thinking of listing in China, or I might actually list overseas in London or in Frankfurt or Euronext. And you can see that different stock markets have different costs. So we can think about the initial issue, which is the IPO, and we have evidence here that in some places, costs of doing business is higher than in other places. So underwriting fees tend to be higher in the US than in, than in Europe. The underwriting fees are about 65 to 7% in the US, and they're only 3 to 4% in Europe. So that would suggest it was more liquid in Europe. You have underpricing in uh, IPOs. Now, I will talk about that in a later lecture, chapter 19. We have listing fees, and you have the professional fees as well. But you also have ongoing costs. And ongoing costs are like the transaction costs that we just spoke about um, a minute ago. So lots of different factors impact upon the cost of capital. And we can see here that uh, different industries have different costs of capital. And now this is a weighted average cost of capital that we're looking at just now. And not only do you have different industries having co different costs of capital, but in Europe, you have differences from the UK. And by and large, the UK tends to have a lower cost of capital than in Europe. But it's not always the case. Now, I'm just going to finish off by talking about different ways in which uh, companies can lower the cost of capital. And it's all about information uncertainty. Now, the first thing is you can improve the way the company is run. In chapter two of my book, I spoke about uh, corporate governance. If you've got better corporate governance, you are giving assurance to investors that the company is going to be run well. So there's less risk involved. And so we could expect to see better governance leads to better liquidity through the transaction costs. Voluntary disclosure. So more often that managers give information out to investors, the better the liquidity will be. And clearly the last one is that you want to avoid financial distress. If you avoid financial distress, you're going to avoid risk. Avoiding risk uh, lowers the cost of capital. So lots of different things to think about there. These are pra practical issues, and hopefully you found that understa uh, understandable and enjoyable. Thank you very much.